Questions, comments? Father John. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the state recognizing the marriage as opposed to differentiating this from the church, it seemed like in the early centuries of the church, marriage was not considered anything more than the state marriage. Is that not true? By whom do you mean? By the church. In other words, wasn't, wasn't marriage recognized in the state, but marriage did not take place in the first couple centuries in the church? That's not what I understand, no. Um, the, as I understand the practice of the early church, because it was in the context of a the early church made a differentiation between a state-recognized marriage and a church-recognized marriage. It wasn't a sacrament unless the church recognized And that's where you have that quote of Tertullian who says that when they, and it was all Eucharistically centered in the practice of the early church, that it was the re common reception of the sacrament together which created the thing which is called Christian marriage. So from so, the very beginning, it was recognized as a sacrament inside the church. Yes, from the very beginning, the church recognized something. I mean, and, and understand in the, in the early days of the church as it was dealing with marriage, and um, Father John Meyendorf brings this out in his history of marriage. From the early days, the church was not a legally recognized entity by the Roman government. So the church allowed its members to be married in such a way so that it would be recognized by the Roman government. Um, because the church marriage meant nothing to the Roman government, and the Roman world, as we shall see, had a distinctively legal understanding of marriage. And so for the couple to enter into this, this larger thing, the legal understanding of marriage, they were often legally married within the context of the state. But that was, the church always had a special, and I mean, Ignatius says that himself, that let no one get married without the consent of the bishop that there was always a blessing that had to come from the church for it to be Christian marriage. And, and we'll be talking a little bit um, more about that as we go along. Yeah. Since many of us were uh, married more than 10 years ago before we were canonically correct, and we had that marriage that you were describing, but, but it was within the context of the present church that we're in, and maybe even the pastors that are here now, is, there, is it a recommendation that we uh, uh, sanctify or correct that marriage within an Orthodox uh, ceremony? Or what's, what's the state of those who were married that way uh, as recognized by the Orthodox Church? Uh, there's probably two questions there. Let me try to distinguish the one from the other. The one would be the, the question, as I understand it, tell me whether I'm hearing your question. One would be, what is the, those who became Orthodox and were received into the Orthodox Church as already married, but never were received the crowning in the Orthodox Church. What is, the, what is their marriage like? Versus then, what is the normal procedure for bringing in couples who are married outside of the Orthodox Church into the Orthodox Church? Because I think they're two different questions. Um, within, to answer the, the, the first question, when you are received, and this is where you have to go back, I think, to, to some early church models as it wrestled, because the situations are unique, and, and historical situations change, and the church is always wrestling with how to take the eternal truth and then apply it within the context of unique historical situations. Um, those who are married outside the church, as they come in together as husband and wife, and are chrismated and receive the sacrament of the Eucharist, their marriage is sanctified. Their marriage is sanctified through being chrismated and receiving the Holy Eucharist. And their marriage is an Orthodox Christian marriage by virtue of, and, and that's where we go back, as I said, the, the question about how the early church dealt with this gives us some insights into the thinking of the church, that it is the reception of the Eucharist as husband and wife which seals and sanctifies that marriage. Um, and, and that's how the church is done. In terms of how couples who are converting should be dealt with, um, there is some discussion of that, but that, that's a much larger discussion. R recently, Bishop Dimitri in our archdiocese has put out a liturgical book for the receiving of couples who were married outside of the Orthodox tradition. And it's interesting because in that that he's put out now, and he's in charge of the liturgical development within our archdiocese, he takes 
He says that they're supposed to be, or supposed to be, that, that the, what he wants done is the prayer right before the crowning to be prayed over the couple, which is the prayer for the Holy Spirit to bless this couple. And so he has put forward at least one rite that is a, some sort of service that sanctifies this, this marriage um, as for use in our parishes. And, and that's just one example of how the church has been trying to wrestle with this question. And if we see that within the context of the history of the church, that's exactly what the church did is it wrestled with how do, how do we deal with this historic situation? Does, does that answer that question? Does that know? Yeah. Um, I, I know in Germany, my friends in Germany, the, if you get married in Germany, the church is not recognized as a, right. a, something that can marry people. So people usually get married a week earlier or a day earlier by the state, and then they have their service. Has it been in America all the time the church has been recognized, or when did it come that the church was recognized as an entity that could perform a marriage? Yeah, within the, I mean, and I'll give you my answer. I've never studied it fully, but as I, I mean, the American legal system was inherited from Britain, um, and within the context of Britain, um, since it was an Anglican structure, and Anglicanism itself was reasonably confused about whether it was Protestant or Catholic, um, so therefore it, it kept some Catholic practices, not really knowing why it kept those Catholic practices, um, which is the history of Anglicanism. Um, never really been quite sure why it was doing much of what it was doing. Um, and so therefore the system which America inherited was that the church did the weddings. But the theology that was, America was started with was distinctively not Anglican and not Catholic and Protestant. And that's why you have this unique situation whereby then the pastor ended up being um, the instrument of the state. And it's interesting because in New York City, before as a pastor you can do a wedding, you have to go to the city manager's office and get approval to do the wedding. You have to show your identification that you are legitimately a, a pastor in a church. And then the state says, okay, you can do the wedding for us. I mean, that shows you how statist it is because there was no church. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Father John, <clears throat> what would your, your opinion of the Orthodox perspective be on the idea of, uh, let's say, the uh, same-sex marriage, uh, if it's the state's thing, do we take the attitude, uh, well, that's the state, they can do what they want, or should we try, like many evangelicals, to save and fight and fight for this? And send and it's, it's a good question because I, I think, I mean, I'll give you my answer, you know, and, and once again, I don't speak for the Orthodox Church, you know, I, I, this is my understanding on, so especially these issues that we're wrestling with. We, there's a sense in which I say, look, if, this, if the state wants to do it, well, I mean, that's folly on the state. Because it's not marriage. You, you see what I'm saying? I don't care what they want to call it. It's not marriage because we're not going to bless it. And if we don't bless it, it's not marriage in, in terms of the sacrament of marriage. Um, so in that respect, I'm not as threatened by it. Because see, what I'm trying to say is instinctively, and, and uh, very few Protestants know their theology. And that's, I mean, they, they, don't, they haven't thought through this. They don't know why they do it. I mean, I didn't as a Protestant understand why it is I always said by the power vested in me by the state of California, you know, I, I declare you man and wife. But instinctively, they know they've got a big problem if the state does not uphold their morals. So that's, I think, it's a much bigger issue for them than it is for us because we've never looked to the state to give its blessing or we've never seen ourselves as this, the, you know, we're not, we don't go around doing the, the United States of America's business, we do God's business. So, but I think then on another level, of course, I'm very concerned um, because any, any step in moral decay, which that is, is, is a huge concern to me. So, but I, I have a great concern and, and I mean, I, you know, I, I'm very glad that we're not doing it. I don't think we should be doing it. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why, um, not the least of which God is not too happy when that kind of thing takes place. Um, but what I was trying to say was that there's, there's a different reaction because as an Orthodox priest, um, my faith remains the same even if the state goes bad because we're not statist. We're not dependent upon the state for our faith or for our practice. W the history of Protestantism teaches when the state goes bad, the church is in big trouble because it's dependent upon the state to reinforce it. And if the state stopped reinforcing it in time, the church is going to change its message. 
which is what has been happening. Yeah. What really shows the difference between what um, the state says and what the church says is after the betrothal, you've completed what the state requires of you, but you haven't even begun to complete what the church requires of you. Right, it's that's right, and that's a good point, um, is the distinction made between the betrothal and the crowning. I also noticed that uh, recently in the Mercury News that not only are they in the, in the wedding announcements, that they're doing wedding announcements and anniversary announcements, but they're also doing commitment announcements with the pictures of the people as well. And, and if you want to look at where we're headed on that, just look at Sweden. If you know anything about Sweden, that's where we're going. I mean, statistics from Sweden no longer, when you read statistics from Sweden, they no longer give traditional statistics i.e. you can't find how many married people got divorced because they also count committed people and and they don't give statistics just for married people anymore because the i mean the nation of sweden so if you go read the statistics it's scary and that's where we're headed as a culture is to um more you know very few people in sweden really get married in the traditional understanding there's more that don't than do yeah why the Eucharist was removed from our ceremony, I suppose it has something to do with liturgics, but I'm not sure. And can you foresee the Eucharist being restored to our ceremony ever time and, and any time? So well, since our I'm lifetime? not a bishop, I don't know about the, the last question. That's not my purview. Um, so I don't know if it'll, you know, it's the, she wanted to know, yeah, the question was, um, A, why the Eucharist got removed from the wedding service, and could I ever foresee the Eucharist being put back into the, the, into the wedding service? And I just said simply that, you know, it's, I do the liturgical texts that are given me, um, and it, it's not my place to try to figure out new ones. Um, the, I, I've read, and I, I'm certainly not, a, by any stretch of the imagination, an expert on, on the liturgical tradition in its intensity and in its fullness. But I have read some from Father John Meyendorf in terms of why it was removed, which had to do with, with the developments in the Byzantium Empire. Um, but I, I really, I don't feel like I can comment on that except to say go read Father John um, because I think there are historic reasons. I don't know personally, I'll give you this, I will give you this opinion. I don't know personally that the Eucharist was ever removed. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was. Because I think the, the intention, it was removed from the service, yes, but it was never removed from the life of marriage. And, and that, the common cup represents the Eucharist. Um, and it still represents the Eucharist for those who are Orthodox. And if they've received the Eucharist together, both before and after that service, the Eucharist has sanctified that wedding. As, as we look, because it all has to do with our whole understanding of the eternality of the now <laughs> and the fact that we enter into the today when we get married. So, so I'm not comfortable, as I think about it out loud, I'm not comfortable with saying that it's been fully removed because I don't think it ever has from the consciousness of the church. Um, anyway. make sure which group I was in, of the two that you answered there. The, uh, <laughs> since you kind of split your answer into two groups. You're uh, married. <laughs> good. But uh, could you give an example maybe of the second group that you said would need to go through a, a ceremony? Because, you know, I, there, many of us were married here within the uh, evangelical Orthodox right, right. tradition that became canonical. Well, the, the, the standard, as it was explained to me, and I, I you know, I will give you the answer that a bishop gave to me when I asked that question, and, and I'm happy with the answer. The standard way for receiving catechumens is to have a service in which their marriage is blessed. That is the standard way. That's why Bishop Dimitri just put the service out. That is the normal way. So when you, as a priest, as was told me by a bishop, you bring one family in, you know, one couple in, you should bless that marriage at the end of the liturgy. That's the normal way of doing it. Um, that's the way it's done. In some Orthodox traditions, you know, they're remarried fully. Um, the bishop explained to me the case with the EOC, it was just simply economia. Because he said if we had started to marry 2,000 people, we'd still be doing it. <laughs> and, 
and, and our theology is, is broad enough to include that. But then, you know, I mean, economia, when economia becomes the rule, then you come up with new economia and then you have real problems. So the normal way, and that's not saying that your marriages haven't been blessed. Of course they've been blessed. That's just saying the normal way for receiving couples within the life of the parish is to have a special blessing for the, for the, for the marriage itself, as it was explained to me by a bishop. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we'll come back. Uh, you were talking about the Old Testament marriage and the Rome and everything. Uh, how, was it, how was marriage at the time of the disciples and Christ? I'm talking about in the time when Jesus was uh, walking on earth, because so much of the Orthodox Church was simply a continuation of the worship there, what was their marriage like and what was it like immediately after in the uh, very early church? I'm talking about, you know, the very first, second centuries, if you know about uh, that. Well, I mean, before Christ, I mean, because before Christ, and a lot of our theology has to teach us this, before Christ, the, the best they could hope for was some sort of life. I mean, you, you find this in the Old Testament. That's why you don't find these great revelations of resurrection in the Old Testament, because th they didn't know, because Jesus wasn't here. The way to heaven was not open. Uh, so before Christ, the best they could hope for in terms of marriage was, was the fullness of human love, and also, you know, the, the children. That's why to be barren um, in the Old Covenant was a curse of God, because to be barren meant there was no posterity. A marriage was considered cursed if it was barren. That's why when Joachim and Anna, those wonderful saints, you know, they went to the temple, they were kicked out. You remember that? That's how they, and then they got the revelation that they were going to have the Theotokos. They were, they were kicked out because they were cursed of God because there was no fruit in their marriage. Um, and that was all very much part of the, that helped to develop this longing then within the soul of the pious Jewish believer for more. You know, and then the time was right, and Christ came and gave us more and fulfilled those longings. And what was your second question? Well, did they have a kind of a service? Oh, they had in a the service. Early church. Uh, I was wondering. Oh, uh, you mean liturgically? Yes, liturgically. Um, yeah, I, I'm, they, are, they are connected. I mean, if you go to a Jewish wedding service today and, and an Orthodox wedding service, you'll see connections. Um, I haven't done any study at all. In, and I'll just be honest, in the derivation of the, the Orthodox wedding service from its Jewish roots. So I, I, that's not my... How early did they have the, what we would call today, a, a sacramental understanding? From the very beginning. Marriage? From the very beginning. I mean, Jesus went. That, that's, that's why that passage in John 2 is so important. That, that is the sacrament. Jesus was there. It made the marriage different. Um, and it made it so different that, you know what St. Simon did when his, honey, when his week of feast was over? You know, St. Simon the Zealot did. He left his wife and followed Jesus. And we go, oh, he destroyed his marriage. I say, no, he fulfilled his marriage. I'll explain how later, but he did. <laughs> he didn't turn his back on marriage. He lived out his marriage in a prophetic way. We aren't, you know, we're not all called, don't all of you men say, oh, I could leave my wife for three years. No, you can't do that. <laughs> You mentioned uh, being married by a justice of the peace and then having the marriage blessed in the church. What of those of us who, before becoming Orthodox, we were married in, the, in our Protestant churches? Would you recommend having our marriages blessed, and what would be involved in that? Uh, I'd recommend that you talk to your priest. I mean, because there's always a danger in situations like this. You know, here I am, I'm a priest of a parish. I'll come in and tell you what I would do. And then you, you know, people, I mean, just think you run to your priest and say, well, Father John would do it. You know, so wonderfully American. And if you don't do it, guess what? I'm traveling. To, not that you would do that. But, but, I mean, a lot of this is pastorally. You have to discuss with your priest and, and, and discuss what would be good for you and, and what in the life of the parish is what's going on. And, and so I, I, you know, I can tell you your marriage is blessed of God and that God is there and it's a sacrament um, and then I run go to your priest and discuss with him because it, it, it just gets very dangerous if I try to give answers for all of those things Father John you said when a man and woman are uh, joined in the sacrament of marriage they enter into the realm of eternal life now when 
they die and enter into the kingdom of God, does that marriage continue on? Yes, or how? absolutely. In, in what way is it? I mean, I know that it's going to be like something beyond our imagination, but it, it, is it like we all absorb into God's love and we're kind of as one, right? It's not going to be like a little pair like it is on earth. Well, I, I don't think on earth it's like a little pair. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, but I think that's an important distinction. Okay. Because that's a very Western understanding. Of, it's a John Wayne approach to marriage. You know, <laughs> get married, get my wife, go out and live by myself. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, and the church has never seen marriage that way. You, try, you do that, you'll get divorced in two years, you know. Because marriage has to be lived in a community. And marriage has to express itself. The love that God has given to us must express itself. And if it doesn't express itself in newness of life, then that marriage is going to destroy itself. The normal way is procreation. It's not the only way. There are many other ways. St. Gregory the theologian says you can have kids without ever having babies because you can have spiritual children. But love, the love has to express itself. That's the, the love has to express itself in newness of life. Yeah. yeah I, I think question here. Simon expressed himself in his marriage if he's left his wife to go follow. I told you I'll talk about that later, I promise. I'll give you the answer to that, but I'm not going to do it now because that's, that's lecture number four. Um, back to the other question about marriage being eternal. I don't understand how if marriage is eternal, um, Christ says that don't worry about it because in heaven there's no giving right. or... Right, good question. Good question. I, hope, I was hoping somebody would ask that. You know, Jesus, the Sadducees and, and the Pharisees come and they say, you know, Moses said that, um, remember the story, Moses said that, you know, if the brother dies and he doesn't have any seed, and that's that, remember the Jewish, you had to raise up seed. It's all in that Jewish understanding of marriage, okay? Um, that's why also there was more than one wife a lot of times in the Old Testament. And it's not an ideal, but it fit within their concept of marriage and not with ours. Um, but, you know, if it dies and dies and dies and dies, and seven men had her, um, which I think is an exact quote from the way they phrased their question, which tells you something about their question. Um, who's going to get her in heaven? And Jesus said, no one, because you've totally misunderstood what heaven is like. Their question was about sex and the whole sexual aspect of marriage. And our tradition teaches us is that that, as good as it is, is part of this world, and that itself becomes transfigured and that there is no sex in the kingdom. But that was not about the eternal bond of love between, he was not saying that that eternal bond of love. Understand, they didn't have a, in a Judaic concept of marriage, because their understanding of marriage was linked to procreation. I mean, that's what you have to understand. When they thought of marriage, they thought of procreation, because that was their understanding of marriage. And Jesus is talking to them, and he says, in heaven, there is no procreation. He was not talking about this transformational understanding of Christian marriage as being something eternal and something divine. He was, he was referring to them in their context. Yeah. So if that's true then, if your husband dies or your wife dies, is it better not to remarry? The tradition itself has said, and this is where, you know, we can get, I don't want to even get our emotions all up to work, but you have to look to the, the tradition has said, yes, it is better not to get remarried. Unless and this is where the church has come along, unless you can't stay unmarried in this world. And then you may get married. That's where St. Paul says, you know, it's better if you remain like I am, but I tell the young widows, get married and have a family. Because they're gonna get themselves in big time trouble if they're young and they're not married. Because they're gonna go to house to house and be busybodies, and they're gonna destroy themselves spiritually, so it'd be better if they got married. But that's not the ideal, and that, the church has never, there's a, the St. John Chrysostom in that letter to a virgin, have you read his letter to the virgin? She's what, 26 and her husband dies and he writes to her and he says, please, please don't get remarried. Please don't get remarried. Stay true to your spouse. St. Macrina, wasn't it Macrina? Who, um, she was betrothed and she wouldn't get remarried because she said he's still alive. And I'm betrothed to him. You want me to get married twice? Um, that's an expression of the church's thought. And you know, we, this is the Westerners, we always turn these things into legal rules. Well, can I or can't I? You know, it's like we used to ask when we were teenagers, how far can I go? <laughs> you know, I feel like half our questions are still, how far can I go? You know, 
You always say, how can I sneak into heaven? What do I have to believe, you know? Do I really have to believe Mary was a virgin to get into heaven? Or is it okay if I don't? You know, it's like, why do you want to sneak into heaven? You know, I want to get in the front row. You know, I don't want to be in the back. You know, I, I mean, that's how the church, I, I, I'm getting into other things, but I mean, it's really true. You know, we all want to sneak into heaven. How, far, how much sin can we get into before we get kicked out? You know? Not that getting married is a second sin. I mean, it's a sin, not at all. I don't, I don't mean that. But the church has wisdom in this. All right, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Angelus, the new martyr. Angelus, the A N G E L I S, yeah, the new martyr. He was martyred by the Turks, I think in the 18th century. His life is found as the life of all married saints, is found in that excellent book by David and Mary Ford, The Lives of the Married Saints, which is excellent. Everyone should get a copy of that. Questions? So in the um, <clears throat> context of orthodox view of marriage, is there a place for counseling, marriage counseling, oh, absolutely. marriage renewal? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, somebody asked me the other question. I'm glad you asked that because somebody said, were you saying then that all techniques are wrong? Well, absolutely not. You know, techniques are great. Not, well, my point was they're not going to save your marriage. But if I can learn how to talk to my wife better, then you know, I want to learn how to talk to my wife better. And if there's some things I'm doing, you know, if falling asleep when she's talking is sending the wrong signal, then I should probably stay away. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but what I meant, what I was saying was that staying awake isn't going to save my marriage if I don't have a right view of what marriage is. Um, so, I mean, I'm, and counseling, I think, you yeah, know, certainly there. And that's, but see, I mean, I think we have to take this, this thing called counseling and bring it back into the life of the church. There has always been marriage counseling. Just like there's always been personal counseling, but it takes place within the community of the church. And, and, and in our day and age, you know, because we don't have good role models, because we don't have a, a lot of grandparents around that we can turn to. I mean, the marriage counselors always in the past were grandparents who had been married 45, 50 years. And they could look at you and say, well, honey, you know, we went through that too. And this is, you know, we don't have that anymore. So then we, we turn to people, you know, and it's not wrong. You know, turn to people like me who, who, who sometimes know what I'm talking about, but I'm, I'm not a grandparent, you know. And others who, who have gained experience um, by just talking to lots of people and dealing. And so there, there's experience that I have in terms of what marriages work and things like that, that, that sort of I've gained through other people. And that's very helpful. I mean, we need to use all of these sources, but never divorced from the life of the church. I mean, I, I just, I can't stress enough how, you know, if, if people, and I think marriage counseling even, uh, just if they don't share your basic presuppositions of what marriage is, there is only so much that they're going to be able to do for you, and then they're going to hurt you. I mean, I really believe that, that we have to be careful. We have to be careful on that. But yeah, no, I mean, in renewals and going away, you know, on spiritual retreats together and things like that, that's the best way to renew your marriage. You know, I don't, I mean, personally, I don't think going, you know, for a weekend to Hawaii does much for a, we a marriage. You know, I mean, it's my own personal opinion. I, I, I think going a weekend to a monastery does a lot more for a wedding, marriage than going to Hawaii. But that's my own personal opinion, so. And if you find a monastery in Hawaii, it's even better. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, for, for me, it seems like, um, I mean, I'm, I am inspired by the vision that you're presenting. I've, I've heard it before also, and every time you hear it, it's very inspiring. But it seems that in the day-to-day -day course of life, whether, I mean, this was, I mean, especially in married life, when you're facing the difficulties that you always come across, it's easy to lose sight of that vision, and it seems to me that the whole path of Christian life, it has to have as its center of, as its, the means of getting there is the cross. The, the, it has to, uh, and it's just, 
if all we have is the teaching about the, the vision of what the end is and of the union with God and this glorious vision, it's not enough to get us through those times when we really have to bear the cross. Right. This is a promo and, for the next two lectures. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I, I'm just feeling like... Um, well, come back. I need really, I need come help back. with that part. Yeah, and come not, back, and you're yeah, going to get more. You see what I'm saying? I promise. Okay. I promise. I promise. You have to get this before you get that, or you get depressed. <laughs> really. I mean, I, I think it's true. <laughs> In some respects, we all have that, right? Any other questions? I will say then, and, and just to finish up, because I don't see any more questions, what, some of what you're saying is, well, how do you keep the vision? I mean, isn't that the struggle of sanctity? Isn't that the same struggle that all of the, the monastic saints and all of the saints, how do you keep a vision of the eternal in a world which is filled with the temporal? That's the struggle of being orthodox, isn't it? I mean, isn't that the struggle? I mean, whether you're married or a monastic or whatever, to get your eyes off of this world and into heaven? That's why we begin. Let us lift up our hearts. Come on, get them up. Get them up. That's why we fast, because we keep getting dragged down. And so we fast to release ourselves. That's why we pray. And that's why I won't go into it, but the most, the, just the basic bare minimum for a married couple um, is you've got to fast together. You know, and I mean fast together, you know, not the contemporary version sometimes, you know, of the watered-down fasting, you know. I mean fast. It's good for your marriage. Don't eat, you know. That's a real slogan, huh? But pray together. Get up early in the morning. Say prayers together at night. Struggle together. Give alms together. If you read the lives of the married saints, they all did three things. They all fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays in the fasting periods of the church. They all prayed, and they all gave alms. And specifically, the virtue which shines most in married saints is the giving of alms. It's almost a distinctive marital virtue. The reason is because a monk gave everything away when he became a monk, and he has very little left to give. Married people continually have things to give. And so of all the virtues that are, are sort of special to the married saint, it's the, giving, the married saints, it's the giving of alms. So that's by way of throwing something in that I didn't have time to throw in anywhere else. But it fits into what you're, how do you keep the vision? That's how you keep the vision. But if you don't fast and you don't pray, you're not going to keep the vision of your marriage. Because the keeping of the vision of your marriage with heaven as a goal is part of an entire orthodox life of keeping heaven before your eyes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For, yeah. Yeah, it says, if husbands and wives attain to unselfish love and the denial of self between themselves. It is a bloodless martyrdom and it fulfills the mystery of the crowning. That's by George Gabriel. It's in his book, You Think My Words Immodest. You understand the promise. And in our tradition, if you know anything about the lives of the saints, you know that very often even saints who struggle are rewarded with a martyr's crown, even if, they're not, if they don't shed their blood for Jesus. There's that one, um, he was of the Jordan. Uh, oh, I forget his name, forgive me. But he really struggled with sexual passion. And he was appointed the, the higher monk responsible for baptizing everyone. <laughs> yeah, God really knows what he's doing sometimes. And, and in those days, of course, you baptized naked. And so he had a real problem when ladies came. And he, went to, he wanted to flee into the desert. And he says, I can't do this. I can't do this. I want out of here. And St. John the Baptist appeared to him and said, I want you to struggle. I want you to struggle. Go back. So he went back and he struggled. I think it was like 20 years. Never gave in to the passion, but man, did he struggle. At the end of his life, St. John appeared to him and gave him a crown of martyrdom. 
and he struggled no more to the end of his life. Isn't that beautiful? That's what I'm saying marriage is about. It's the struggle. And if we stay at the struggle, we will be awarded the crown, the crown that belongs to the martyrs. Yeah. What boundaries would you put on a marriage that is abusive? It's, it's a good question. Um, in fact, I knew someone was going to ask it. Um, I would put the boundaries of love on that marriage. And having said that, I would say that I cannot give you legal categories for determining that, but that that is something that has to be dealt with with your priest. Because there are some, and I think in some respects, the only thing, I mean, we're in the realm, and please, we're, in the, we're out of the realm of law, because law doesn't apply here. We're into the realm of love, and we're into the realm of, of, of really ascertaining God's will for your life, because I really believe God's will is different for different people in that kind of marriage. All I can remember is there's a story, and it's always stuck with me, of St. Alban, who went to the monastery. Remember, if you know anything about the history of, of, of Western Christi, Orthodox Christianity, you know that the monks would go and they would um, build their monasteries off the island, and then the, the Vikings would come down and kill them all. Um, and St. Columba started his monastery, and they all got slaughtered by the Vikings. And St. Alban said, I'm going back because his work is not going to die, and I'm going to start a monastery and keep it going. And I know what that means, I'm going to get killed, but that's okay, because I'm going to go back and be a martyr for God. So he got a bunch of guys who went with him, and they started this monastery. The Vikings heard about it, the Vikings came down, and th this is so wonderfully orthodox, the way he dealt with it. And they were in divine liturgy, and they heard that the Vikings were coming. And he stood up and he said to them, listen, the Vikings are coming, and we will be martyrs. Those who know it is the call of God to give your blood, stay. Those who are not ready, leave, and may God go with you. Isn't that beautiful? No guilt trips? I mean, we, you know, if I'd have been me, I would have said, those who are truly Christian, who really love Jesus with their whole soul, stay and be martyred, you wimps, leave the back door. That's how I would have done it. <laughs> but it says, he says, if this isn't the call of God for you right now, I don't judge you. There's the door. You may leave. And God bless you. But those who are called to martyrdom stay. You see, it's freedom. And I think every situation has to be embraced in the context of freedom and in the context of your relationship with those whom you trust to give you good spiritual advice. Because I don't think you can make it by yourself. And I think that involves your parish priest, but I think it involves more than your parish priest. I think it involves a, a community who can help you through that situation. Does that, does that help answer the question? Yeah, let me take a question farther then. We work with the children of very abusive parents right. who are so warped and so wounded that their whole view of God and of yeah. fatherhood is permanently damaged. And I think, boy, if we could have gotten those kids out. Right. Or if the mother would have left the father when she knew the abuse started, right. maybe those children would have had a more of a chance for a healthy life. And I think that, that go, that's part of what goes into this whole decision-making process. You know, I mean, the, I, I'm thinking of two situations um, in which I've dealt with without going into the particulars, but one, both situations with abusive husbands. One situation um, where the children are grown, and the free act of the wife of martyrdom has been to stay in the marriage. Another situation in which the children are young and for her love for the children, she left. Um, and, and both of those decisions were made in freedom and I think, I'm convinced, both of those decisions were in keeping with our tradition. Because our tradition is wonderful, it's not legal. I mean, it, it lets you deal with those situations. And that's why I said, I, I, that's why I can't stand up here and say, well, if these three things happen, then leave. And if these three, you know, because our tradition doesn't work that way. It's very pastoral. And, and that's, that's, so that, I don't know. You know, these are all issues that, that go into the factor of the decision-making process. Any other questions? But I also know that 90% that of the people who are leaving marriage today are not leaving because they're being abused. They're leaving because their wife isn't the kind of wife they want her to be. And, and most of us, I know some of us deal with abusive situations. Most of us struggle with crosses that aren't life-threatening. They're pride-threatening. Any other questions? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
in the refrigerator. <laughs> She's much more kind and gracious and obedient than I am, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a Protestant, in many men's books and articles, you would read uh, that the key to being happy is to setting your priorities. Like God number one, your wife number two, Right. And uh, I'm a single person, so this is like a major inquirer's class for me. Okay. <laughs> but um, with that idea, it always seemed like looking ahead to that in the future, that that would be separate. But now what you're saying is, is that to love your wife or your future wife um, sacrificially and as a martyr would be the ultimate expression of loving God. Absolutely. So you couldn't really love your wife more than God, could you? Absolutely. You've got it. You've got it. That's it. That's it. That's it. I love God by loving my wife. You know, as an example of this, there's a guy in, in my church, and I won't tell you who it is, but um, he, he really was struggling, and he loves to do prostrations. Okay, he, he, just, his, he loves to go in and just prostrate. Boom, boom, boom. That's his prayer life, prostrations. And yet, you know, his wife would get so mad because he always went and did his prostrations right after dinner which is when all the dishes needed to be washed and the kids watched. And so finally I said to him, your prostrations are the dishes in the sink. Okay? It's a hundred if you finish. <laughs> because to him, that was how, that was his asceticism, was to do the dishes. And that was harder than any hundred prostrations he had ever done in his life. And that's, that's exactly the point. We tend to divorce these things, and, and they're not divorced. We love God by loving our wives, and we love God together. Praying together, fasting together, coming to church together, receiving the Eucharist together, raising our kids together, enduring together. Yeah. Then you did answer my question about Simon. His wife must have been in agreement. Yes. Correct. That's right. Okay. That's right. And they both followed Christ. And that's what brings us ultimately together, is that we follow Christ together. That's right. Good. Yeah. I can see where this would go really well with your children as well. As a good example in a marriage, but also just serving them. Right. But um, I have five children, and picking up all their shoes, <laughs> I mean, that's all I would do all the time. Right. Where do you break up? Showing these things versus responsibility, let's say, in, with your children, because... Right. It's, I mean, I would, the, the, one of the answers that I would, I would have for that is that you're responsible to train your children, but you're not responsible to train your husband. I mean, there's a different, when we're responsible for the training, then, then we can say, look, you know, you need to clean this up, and if you don't, I punish you. What the problem is, we usually do that to our spouse. You know, you need to clean this up, and if you don't, I'll punish you. But God never appointed us to, to raise our spouse. He appointed us together to raise our kids. But I do think that this, I mean, this is not the way most people approach marriage. And I mean, parenthood. And this is parenthood, self-denial, patience, and obedience. That is parenthood, you know. And there's a lot of joy, but this is parenthood. And one of the problems today is that people don't want this to be parenthood. They want to have a life that was just like the life before the kids came. And most of the discipline of kids today is not because we care about the kids, but it's because they embarrassed us or because they're making our life difficult or because they don't let us do what we want to do and just shut up and go to bed, all right? Okay, not because we're concerned about them. And our kids know it. And that's why they don't listen to us. But that's, that's Father Terry's lecture. <laughs> Any other questions? When you are upset and you, you, you want to, you know, this is your cross, how do you pray and trust God and honor your marriage you know, by honoring God and deny yourself and be obedient when it's something that, like, the other person's view could change on? I mean, truly, mm -hmm. not just that if you, if you said, I'll endure this for the cross, then, um, the, then your mind changes. How do you just 
give the other person over to God when you are upset like that? Well, my observation is, and I think that this is confirmed by the tradition, my observation of marriages is the only time our spouses really change is when we give them the freedom not to change. You know, I have seen my wife do things that I never thought she would do because I stopped requiring her to do them. You know, sometimes I just gave up. She's never going to do it. I came home three weeks later, she had done it. And I was shocked, you know. She cooked fish for me the other week, you know. I couldn't believe it. After eight years of telling her she had to cook fish for me and her refusing, I stopped telling her two years ago and I got fish. Um, that's a simple example, but it's true. And the same thing's true because when you back your spouse into the corner and he or she feels controlled, that she, it, we, when we back them into this corner where if you want me to love you, then you better do exactly what I tell you or you're not going to get loved anymore. They don't change. That isn't how God deals with us, is it? I mean, that's how I used to think he dealt when I was a Protestant. But now that I'm Orthodox, I know it's very different that God loves us. And God motivates us to change by saying, I love you so much, and I always will love you, right? And that, I think that that answers is, is that if we just accept what's in our marriages and accept our spouse and give them the freedom to be the person that God has called them to be rather than the person we want them to be, we will find, you know, and, and if you've got a marriage in which two people are practicing self-denial, patience, and obedience, what a marriage! That's heavenly! Because there's two saints in it, then. Yep. Uh, having them, allowing them to have the freedom to be who God wants them to be rather than who we want them to be. How do you distinguish allowing, just you just let them be whatever God is in their walk of self-denial showing them to be? I mean, I think, and it's, it's a hard question sort of to answer in very general terms, but I would say, in, specific, in, in sort of general sense, what I would think is that we have to, in our marriages, um, not try to be the spiritual director for our spouse. And that's why it's so important that our marriages be both that we, we're in a church in which each of us is receiving spiritual direction. I mean, I really think that that's crucial because if we give, if we let go, as we should, and, and give freedom to our marriages. What counterbalances is that is that we're, we're both submissive to a spiritual father who gives us direction. And I found that in my marriage and in other marriages, the concept of a spiritual father is liberating for marriage. Because we're, we're both not only in submission and obedience to each other, but we're both in submission and obedience to the church. And so there are limits that are set but then I don't have to, you know, you, sometimes in marriage you get that sense where you're just holding them back, you know? You know what I mean? Just keeping, because if you let go, boy, all, all bets are off. And if you're within the context of the church, that's, there's those safeguards there. Um, and, and I think that that, so I don't know if that helps to answer, but that's, that's why marriage has to be, as I've said, lived within the context of the community. Um, and we have to get away from this John Wayne idea. Me and my gal. Oh, yeah. I have this picture of, you know, you saying, I'm enduring this for Christ. And, and it becomes a little distorted where it's kind of like the attitude is like um, almost boastful. How do you get away from, you know, dealing with the attitude of, I'm doing this for, for Christ, you know? <laughs> right, right. And getting the right heart attitude about it. So well, that's, that, that's why this cross has to be erected in our I mean, that's where confession comes in, because if we find that, I mean, this is why marriage cannot be lived outside of the sacramental life of the church, because if you find that's happening in you, how do you deal with sin in your life? How do you deal with pride in your life? What do you do? You go to confession and you confess it. I mean, this is how everything is interconnected. And, and you receive then counsel from your spiritual father on how to deal with your pride. And, and that's, uh, that's what I'm saying is that marriage provides us all these opportunities to do the real spiritual work that we need to do on ourselves. Because if you see that in yourself, then that's, that's something you need to work on. And that's, the, that's what the sacraments are here for. That's what the priesthood is here for. That's what the church is here for, is to provide us those resources. Yeah. 
How might you apply this in a situation where a spouse is doing something very harmful to themselves, uh, such as a substance abuse problem, right. um, where you're trying to be patient and obedient and deny yourself, but you also see that your spouse is destroying themselves? Maybe you can comment comment on that. Yeah, and and I mean there are as we as you work through this, and I, I mean I'm glad for these questions because I don't ever want to be. I mean, the wonderful thing about our tradition is we understand the complexity of life. And we can teach the ideal, but then we also recognize that that ideal has to be applied within the historic context, and that sometimes that, the application of that ideal is difficult. Um, so, so I'm glad you asked, because that's a hard situation. I mean, and it's very difficult. I feel very frustrated standing up here to give some sort of blanket answer to, to that, because it's so unique, but clearly if, and that's where I, th I think, you know, that if our spouse is doing something that they are actively hurting themselves, then that's not the issue I'm talking about here in self-denial, obedience, and patience. And, and at that point, we need to do all that we can to try to help them stop hurting themselves um, within the context of understanding we can't control them either. You know, and that's the, this thing about free will, I really like it, but I hate it because it means that sometimes I can't make people do the right thing. And I even have to give people the freedom to do the wrong thing and love them. And that hurts probably more than anything else without participating in their sin. And that's, once again, why these decisions have to be made and your marriage has to be lived within the context of the larger community because you can't make those decisions by yourself. And that's why God has given us a community and that's why God has given us his church. Is that, you know... hidden parts of the, oh, the hidden parts to the cross yeah yeah I don't have them memorized let me look back I've got the cross memorized I just obviously I don't do it enough because I don't know them by heart self-denial I'll start with patience patience from patience comes hope I mean yeah think about James 2 let's go back to James 1 2 you know blessed are you endured all things for he who has endured, you know, the joy comes and the hope, but the hope comes from patience, St. Theophan says. Um, obedience develops love. And from self-denial comes faith, and out of self-denial comes joy. Because the most joyful person in the world is the person who wants nothing. Let <laughs> I me mean, think about it. If you wanted nothing out of life, you would be so happy. It's true. That's true. I mean, in, in a deep spiritual sense, just to accept God's will without hidden agendas. Could anyone else? Yeah. Can you talk about um, uh, submitting to each other? But you didn't talk about the idea of the wife submitting to her husband. And I know in the evangelical world, at least in the Bay Area, there's been a big movement toward mutual submission and erasing this part about wives submitting to their mates or husbands. So can you clarify, um, well, that's a big question, I know, but you know, kind of the boundaries and the foundation for which a wife submits to her husband over or in lieu of or different from mutual submission to each other? Well, certainly we can't erase the Bible, um, especially not as Orthodox Christians because we believe in all of it. Um, and then my second answer is that would really require a whole other lecture, which I would be willing to give at some point. Um, but what I can do is I think the best answer to that is to go back and read St. John Chrysostom as he talks about the way this is underst understood within the context of marriage. His, his understanding of submission of the wife, which we believe but also of loving headship is so wonderfully balanced. Um, and I'd really suggest, if, if you want to find it, it's at the back of Father John Meyendorf's book on marriage. Just the part is in there, and you can read that. So are you saying this is not an orthodox idea? That, mutual that, submission to each other? Well, mutual submission, I, I mean, I, I don't know what the Protestants mean by it, because I've been out of the Protestant world for four years, so I don't know what the cur current terminology means. Um, so I, I can't, 
I don't, I mean, I don't know because I haven't read any, I don't know what they mean by that. I would say that the idea that there is no headship in marriage is not a biblical idea. It can't be a biblical idea, and it's certainly not a patristic idea. Um, but I think if that by that the Protestants are trying to understand freedom. See, the Protestant world suffers from, do I have time to do this? The Protestant world suffers from an inability to relate freedom and authority. So it always, I, and this is the, the predestinarian versus the Arminian debate that just continues on all levels because of the denial, of, because grace and, and nature are always seen as being opposed to each other. So the Protestant world oscillates from this rigid authoritarianism to this egalitarianism on the one hand. And it just is always oscillating because it has no doctrine of synergy and because it has no understanding of freedom and yet freedom not negating authority. I mean, because it has these theological problems, the world, and you know, I've seen it, you know, it just, when it comes to the issue of the family and role relations, it just goes back and forth and back and forth because it has no theology that can deal with it. Because if you don't have a doctrine of synergy and understand the relationship of God's sovereignty and man's freedom within the context of that doctrine, you're never going to understand the roles of men and women because men and women play out Christ and his church. And if you don't understand Christ and his church, you're never going to understand the husband and the wife. So, I mean, that's, so I can't, I mean, but so we believe in both. And we don't say that they, and that's why I said read St. John because it's a wonderful explanation of it. I think it's really helpful. All right, I want to close then with the Synaxarian from, I'm gonna to try to get through this one without crying, it's short. The Synaxarian from October 9th, my favorite married saints in the whole wide world, Saints Andronicus and Athanasia. And this is what's said in the, the short little that you read during Matins. On the same day, October 9th, we commemorate our venerable father Andronicus and his wife Athanasia. In asceticism in this world, as well as in the next, Athanasia has remained at the side of Andronicus. Isn't that beautiful? In asceticism, self-denial, patience, and obedience in this world, as well as in enjoying the joys of the next. Athanasia has remained at the side of Andronicus. May God bless you and may that be said of your marriage. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Try to her with all our strength.